Good morning, everyone. Welcome to All Souls Unitarian Church. <clears throat> My name is Greg Sanders, and I am our music director. And during our Zoom services, I'm also functioning as our technical director. Thank you much for, so much for joining us today. Um, a lot of us are old hat at this by now, but if you have any questions about the Zoom services, please reach out to myself on the chat and I'll help you with that. Um, we encourage you to stay muted throughout the service. Um, and we also encourage you to observe the service through speaker view. Don't forget that afterwards we'll have a virtual coffee hour. We encourage you to talk a little bit um, and visit with each other online so that you can have a chance to talk to each other and say hello. Today's service, uh, Reverend Miller is presiding over, he's doing a sermon called To Be Called, and our worship associate is Teddy Rahill. Teddy has some opening words for us. Um, we're so glad to have you. Again, I'm here for anything you might need. Enjoy the service today. Good morning. I am Teddy Rahill, serving as worship associate for this morning's service. Welcome to our service. We are online today and through the rest of the month. Reverend Joel will continue to communicate with the congregation about what we can expect about returning in person. We currently have coffee hour on Zoom after every service. You can find the link for coffee hour via Zoom on the homepage of our website at allsoulsinmeet.org. If you would like to receive our weekly email news, Sarah Cannon will tell you in a few moments about how you can do that in our connection bar. If you are a visitor with us this morning, we are glad you are here. In a few moments, we will open our service with the beautiful ritual of the covenant and chalice life. We say our covenant as a way to remember and live out the community of love and justice we aim to be. Welcome. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to All Souls Sunday Morning Service. If you are uh, a first time visitor, or even if you're a long time member, the connection card can be an excellent way to get and to stay in touch with us so that you know what's going on at All Souls, so that you can make sure that you're added to our weekly publications and so on and so forth. I do want to make sure that I specifically remind our youth that we have um, youth group today beginning at noon. And that will be online. The link is in Dear Families, and I hope that you'll turn up for that. The link to our connection card is in the chat for folks to fill out at this time. Thank you. We summon ourselves from the demands and delights of our everyday lives. Dirty dishes, unwaxed floors, unmowed grass, untrimmed bushes, unshoveled snow, from all the incomplete and not yet started, from the mundane and the unresolved. Find ourselves called to attend to our vision. Vision of peace of justice, of delight, devotion, of the lovely, the holy, a calling to find out who we are and what we can do about it. We summon now the power of tradition and the exhilaration of what is being born this very moment, summon the wisdom of ages and the knowledge and foresight of the young. May our worship open our eyes, our ears, our minds, our hearts to the fullness of life and to the beauty of all the life around us. We have gathered. Let us worship. At this time, Annalise Kinslow will light our chalice. Love is the spirit of this church and service is its law to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, 
and to help one another. This is our covenant. Good morning. Today we come together to talk about what it means to be called. What does that even mean? Well, the answer is not so obvious. Everyone has their own definition of what it means to be called. I believe that your calling is the thing that you were put on this earth to do. I believe it is your purpose and your contribution to society. I also believe that your calling finds you, not the other way around. Not everyone finds their calling, but, but that's not a bad thing. For example, my own mother has had five, maybe six different careers. She's been amazing at most of them, but none of them were her calling. She knew that. So when I sat to wrote this, I asked myself, what is my calling? Well, I sat for a while and thought. And after some time, I thought, well, I don't know. I'm just a kid. I tried to think of something that followed me throughout my life. Then it came to me, theater. Since I was a, just a kid, um, theater was always a major part of my life. My brother was always in a show and I was always watching. Both of my parents tried to convince me to perform in something, anything. I would always break down in tears and start yelling, I don't want, I was terrified of the stage. I didn't understand it. But why would someone go on stage and embarrass themselves in front of so many people? My mom wanted me to try something new, sign me up for a one week theater camp at Carmel City without my permission. That week of camp, I fell in love with that extremely terrifying stage. Then from there on, I've done countless shows and intend to do more. But one thing that all those shows I've done in my life have in common is the opportunities to be in them came to me not the other way around. This is one of the reasons that I now know it is my calling. I intend to continue to perform throughout my whole life as I cannot imagine life without a theater. There's another reason I know my, the uh, my calling is theater. I'm lucky. My opportunity to uncover my calling presented itself to me at a young age. And a lot of people are not that fortunate. But I hope that you leave today remembering that even if you haven't found your calling, it's never too late to find it. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much for that, Teddy. I really enjoyed that. Good morning, everyone. This is one of my favorite weekends and I'm really hoping that we'll be able to celebrate it together in person next year. Do you know what Monday is? It's Martin Luther King Jr. Day. I love MLK Day because when my children were small and Barack Obama was president, he and First Lady Michelle Obama reminded us each year that this is a national day of service and encouraged us to make it the kickoff to a whole season of service that led up to Earth Day in April. So my kids and I volunteered, often with other Unitarian Universalists, and it felt so good to live into our principles that way. It makes sense to serve others on Martin Luther King Jr.'s special day because he often spoke about how important this work was and why he felt that his theology called him to do it. Now, we all talk about Dr. Martin Luther King as a civil rights activist, and he was, but he was also a minister like Reverend Joel. So a lot of the important things he said, he told us from the pulpit. One day, he preached a sermon called The Three Dimensions of a Complete Life. You might know a little bit about dimensions from the makerspace. For example, I know Bridget helped measure the wood for the step stools we're working on. So maybe she knows already that when we talk about dimensions, we're talking about length and width and height. 
Martin Luther King Jr. said that length is the concern we have for ourselves as we travel through life from the time we're born to the time we die. Width or breadth is the care we have for people around us. And height is us reaching for understanding of what he would definitely have called God and what we sometimes call the mystery. He says we need all three of these things to be complete. Now, the length part of his sermon is pretty interesting because he does talk a lot about having a calling, which is something Reverend Joel is going to talk about today. I'll put a link to the text, the printed words, and a link to the recording of the whole sermon in the chat so you can hear that part. I'm also going to play a little bit of the sermon in a second. And if you listen closely, you'll hear something we learned about last week when we talked about jazz, call and response. You see, people do call and response in music, but they do it during sermons too. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. talks about a famous story Jesus told called the Good Samaritan. Maybe you know it. A lawyer asks Jesus, who is my neighbor? Now, he doesn't mean, what's the name of that woman that lives next door to me? If you think about it, he was asking a pretty big question about who we are and who we are called to care for. And Jesus told him a story. There's a dangerous road across a desert called the Jericho Road. And Martin Luther King had actually been there and driven a car down this road. And he said he understood when he saw it, why Jesus chose it for his story. It's long and hilly and curvy. And there are a lot of places where somebody could sneak up on you. And in this story, somebody did sneak up on a Jewish man traveling on that road and beat him up and robbed him and took his clothes and left him there. And two different people came by and saw the man and didn't stop to help him. But a third man did, even though he was a Samaritan. And at the times, Samaritans and Jewish people didn't get along at all. Now, Martin Luther King said he understood why the first two men didn't stop to help. He'd seen a man by the side of the road one day, and he hadn't stopped to help either. Now, this is an old recording, so you'll hear a bit of bumpiness, but listen to how he explains it. I say to you this morning that the first question that the priest asked was the first question that I ask on that Jericho Road of Atlanta known as Simpson Road. First question that the Levite asked was, if I stop to help this man, if I stop to help this man, what would happen to me? But the good Samaritan came by and he reversed the question. Not what will happen to me if I stop to help this man, but what will happen to this man if I do not stop to help him. This was why that man was good and great. He was great because he was willing to take a risk for humanity. He was willing to ask what will happen to this man, not what will happen to me. This is what God needs today. Men and women who will ask what will happen to humanity if I don't help. What will happen to the civil rights movement if I don't participate. What will happen to my city if I don't vote? What will happen to the sick if I don't visit them? This is how God judges people in the final analysis. That really hit home with me. What will happen if I don't do something? I think that's a pretty big and important question. Now, after this, he goes on to tell us to remember that we have what we have because of others. He says that we get up in the morning and we wash our face with soap someone made far away and we dry our faces with a towel someone made far away and we eat breakfast someone else grew far away. He says that before you got out here to church this morning, you were dependent on more than half the world. 
So what Jesus was saying in the story of the Good Samaritan and what Martin Luther King Jr. was saying is that when we think about who is our neighbor, we should think big. We should think about people nearby and people far away. We should think about the people who make our lives possible and the people whose names we might never know who could just use some help and support. And this is the spirit that inspired the Obamas to call us to acts of service on Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Now, if you're saying to yourself, I wish I could volunteer somewhere on Monday, but Omicron is messing things up lately. I hear you. I had that same thought, but you know what? There are still ways to help. In fact, it seems to me that one of you told me just the other week that even your elf on the shelf was involved in acts of service over the holidays. So here are some things we can do. We can put food in some tiny free food pantries or drop it off at a food bank. We can add books to little free libraries in our community. We can write thank you notes and send them to our local hospitals. We can write letters to folks who live alone and might appreciate a card. You use believe it's important to do these kinds of things. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. thought so too. And he explains it in a way that made me laugh. I hope you'll listen to the rest of his sermon so you can hear it. And I hope that on Monday, you'll feel called as a Unitarian Universalist to do an act of service. Thank you. We share the depths of our lives, the joys and concerns, acknowledging the personal, the individual experience, so that we may then also share in the community experience, the experience of being a people. The mask, yeah, that's a sorrow. I'm just I'm gonna wear a mask. And pull it on and off each time. Serious sorrows. Here in Indiana, Senate Bill 167, House Bills 1134 and 1040, affecting our teachers, our schools, quality of our children's education, their ability to hear truth in the classrooms, to have reasoned discussions with each other with the assistance of their instructors, their teachers. Sorrows and compassion for our neighbors in Texas, Jewish neighbors in Texas, the synagogue attacked yesterday, hostages taken. Sorrows for our nation, which now struggle to have fair elections and to counter the lies that the last election, the elections this past year and the year before were not fair, complete lies. And our hearts go out to the house who are struggling with COVID. and joys, the joy of this beautiful day, the joy for this congregation, for its youth and its children, and the privilege we have of serving them, and the joys for this ministry that we have in our individual and our community ministry together, we have the opportunity to become more than we ever could have been alone or without these calls. I offer this prayer, you need not be a theist or an atheist 
or even sure of any belief at all in order to be invited into the contemplation of this prayer. Dear great lathe of heaven, boundary of souls, you churning, burning cosmos, which has wrought us on the infinite loom of your body, spinning stars in different stones. Hear our prayers, hear this prayer. Mind us, call us not to diminish our lives by turning from our dreams, from the calls of our hearts and our souls and our loyalties. Let our vision grow, our hearts be filled with love. Let us not despair that we cannot do it all in this lifetime because we won't, no one has. Rather than despair or hopelessness or mere comfort, bless us with unsettled spirits. Grant us dreams so great, so numerous that we could not possibly begin to understand them all, much less fulfill them. May we spend the love and energy of our lives working to fulfill them nonetheless. Beautiful universe that bore us and will one day bring us back as one. Allow us, allow us to leave these beautiful, amazing lives with a lot of unfinished business. So be it. Amen. Blessed be. So what does it mean to be called? I had several experiences that I didn't, at the time, understand were callings. But after a year of theological school and many conversations with other students and with minister, other clergy, ministers, rabbis, imams, I understood that I had experienced some calls. Mine had a bit of drama to them. Both came with visions, uh, more than two actually. They've come with visions. They've come with perhaps even conversations. I'll be honest, I'm a humanist and, uh, and I'm a theist. And the humanist in me is like, what guy? I mean, uh, whatever happened there, that was a bit of a hallucination. I hope you're okay. Maybe you should uh, check that out with your doctor. And the theist in me goes, oh my gosh. I just had a mystical vision. I've had some uh, colleagues and I had some classmates at the time who were feeling a little jealous that I had such dramatic calls. Hmm. Usually such big things come with responsibilities. Be careful what you wish for. Not that I'm not grateful. I had understood this a little better when I understood how Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was called to ministry, he wrote that my call to the ministry was neither dramatic nor spectacular. It came neither by some miraculous vision nor by some blinding light experience on the road to life. Moreover, it did not come as a sudden realization. Rather, it was a response to an inner urge that gradually came upon me. This urge expressed itself in a desire to serve God and humanity, 
and feeling that my talent and my commitment could best be expressed through the ministry. God had placed a responsibility upon my shoulders, and the more I tried to escape it, the more frustrated I would become. A few months after preaching my first sermon, I entered theological school seminary. Dr. King's call to ministry was compelling. It came slowly, not with any drama. Each of us has a kind of call to ministry. Why else would we be at church? But there is the search and then a call for a minister, someone whose ministry is to help you tend to your ministries. When your search committee finds that minister they believe is a good match for the ministry here at All Souls, they will present that candidate, that ministerial candidate to you in a week, probably the first week of May. It's called Candidating Week. And if you agree with your search committee, having interviewed and heard from this ministerial candidate, you will then at the end of that week, gather as a congregation at a congregational meeting and vote to call your next minister. No one can tell you who your next minister will be, but you, the people of the congregation. That is the heritage and tradition of Unitarian Universalism. And there's something very important about that. I may feel called to do something. You may feel a call to, to a ministry. But it does go, in our movement, it goes one step further. No one self-calls. The test of every call is whether others recognize it, see it, want the benefits of it. To be the minister of all souls, to feel called to the ministry of this congregation, you as a community will have to agree with that. And that is how it should be. And as I said, to experience a calling is not unique to clergy, teachers, educators feel calling. Nurses, doctors, other medical practitioners also feel a calling. I've had a couple plumbers and I've eaten at a couple of restaurants where the chefs really do have callings. We all can have callings. Be called to service, to ministry in life in some way. Will we say yes? And will we Will we submit to the essential need to have it verified by others? There's an Old Testament story that sort of sets up the whole tradition and understanding of what it means to be called. It's in the Old Testament, comes from the book of Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah has a dreamlike experience. He's in the holy temple and God is seated on a great throne and there are these enormous winged angels called seraphs hovering around and singing, holy is the Lord. I don't know if you've ever seen um, uh, Indiana Jones. I think it's in the first um, uh, movie where uh, the bad guys open the Ark of the Covenant and out comes one of the seraphs. The guy melts uh, and Indiana Jones says, close your eyes, don't look. That way they don't get melted. Um, that actually has some truth roots in the tradition of seraphs and angels. You really weren't supposed to look at them. But in the dream, Isaiah gets to look at the seraphs. He says, whoa, I am looking at God. I'm looking at seraphs. And who am I? I'm just some guy. I, I can't, my, my mouth's not even clean. I don't even speak well. Then one of the seraphs takes a hot coal from the temple's altar. Seraph takes it with a pair of tongs, swipes it across Isaiah's lips, and says, now this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed, your mouth is clean. And Isaiah hears then God say, 
Who shall I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah says, not quite understanding that it's him. Here, I, here am I, send me, send me. Now here I'm talking about gods and callings, angels. You know, we Unitarian Universalists have a wide diversity of beliefs and even spiritual practices. So our name, yes, it reflects the Christian roots of Unitarian Universalism. So does the idea of call beginning in, in Judaism and uh, how it, it, it then uh, grew it through its connections through Christianity and then into our own Unitarian Universalism. But this isn't to deny our other roots in Judaism itself, Buddhism, Hinduism, earth-based religions, our own individual experiences, even the science of how we human beings make meaning and seek justice. So it's important to understand that rabbis may not exactly think of themselves as called. Certainly a Buddhist Lama, especially in this tradition of Buddhism, which is not theistic, probably wouldn't imagine themselves as being called. But you know, you don't need to believe in a god or goddesses or pantheons of any sort to have an experience of being called, at least not in Unitarian Universalism. I have colleagues who are humanists and atheists they still have an experience of being called to ministry, perhaps by a community, or perhaps by a deep commitment to justice and to love and to beauty. In the second book of the Lord of the Rings, that trilogy by J.R.R. Tolkien, the young hobbit Frodo is asked by Bilbo Baggins and the wizard Gandalf to say yes to a call to return a powerful gold ring to a big volcano where it was forged. And that same location being the only place that could destroy the ring, the ring of great power and evil. Turns out Frodo has a great call, one of great danger. He has to leave the comforts of the Shire and journey through terrible danger to save his community indeed saved the world from the ring and the power behind it. When he realizes it, Frodo realizes what he's called to do. The book says, a great dread fell on Frodo as if he was awaiting the pronouncement of some doom he vainly hoped might never be spoken. An overwhelming long, longing to rest and be at peace in Rivendell filled his heart and at last with an effort he spoke and he wondered to hear his own words as if some other will was using his small voice. I will take the ring, though I do not know the way. When Dr. King first said yes to his calling, he understood that there were some risks. He answered the call. But he continued to say yes. In his first year of his ministry, after he'd been ordained, he had a meeting with those who were organizing the Montgomery boy bus boycott. They needed a leader, a speaker for this movement. No one wanted the responsibility. Many were called. Dr. King said yes. This yes was significant because there were dangers being the leader of a bus boycott in Alabama in the late 1950s, perhaps even a risk to his life. He could have said no, but like Sarah said, what would have happened? What would have happened to his community? What would have happened to the world if he'd not said yes?
Dr. King continued to say yes. He was stabbed at one point by a racist assassin in the early 1960s. And then his home with his family in it, shot at, racist attempted to set it aflame with his family in it. He still said yes to the call. He still led the movement for rights, for civil rights and more. He still said yes, even when 1968 came and 75% of Americans would have said they hated Dr. King, especially outraged at his opposition to the, to the Vietnam War and his support for unions. And the FBI at that time had a 17,000 page file on him and called him the most dangerous man in America. He kept saying yes, and his call became more and more profound, or in the words of the FBI and some other leader, leaders in the United States, more dangerous. So it was when he went to Memphis to support the sanitation workers' strike for a fair wage, fair working conditions. That began to frighten the powerful. Because at that moment, what he was doing was not just advocating for Black Americans. He was advocating for Americans. He was advocating for working class people. And he hoped to unite Black folks with rural working class white folks. Think of it. If we had a, a prophetic leader called to unite Trump supporters with supporters of the pro progressive congressperson, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. I'm sure there would be some very powerful people very, very afraid if someone were to become successful at that. I'm sure that the owners of Facebook and Exxon and AT&T would do what was they thought necessary to silence that voice. It was just days after Dr. King went to Memphis for a second time that he was assassinated. Another leading minister from the black American tradition, the Reverend Howard Thurman, writer, mystic, minister, he explained what it means to say yes to a calling. He said, don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive and do that because that is what the world needs. People who have come alive. And for the same reason, Dr. King continued to say yes. He chose life. He was choosing life. Didn't want to die certainly didn't want to risk his family. Greta Scott St. King said, yes, we are called with you, yes. He said yes, because he knew had he said no, he would have felt countless small deaths every day, every year that followed. For Dr. King, a fate worse than even his So I confess I'm, um, I'm grateful. I don't appear to have had a calling with demands like Dr. King's. If I get a, call, a calling with those kinds of, one that deep, one that important, I hope I say yes. But I have learned that every calling asks something of us. Callings are not easy. They don't come without responsibilities. When life calls, it's calling us out of our comforts, out of the shire, if you will. A genuine call has inconveniences, discomforts, sacrifices. 
it's said sometimes that those who wish to serve as president of the United States have a calling. Actually, to serve as president of the United States is not a calling. The desire to serve the well being of everybody in this country, in these United States, that is a calling. There is something in every one of us, wrote Dr. Thurman, something that waits and listens for the sound of our genuine selves. It is the only true guide you will ever have. If you not, do not listen for it, you will all of your life spend your days on the end of strings that somebody else holds. priest and a mystical thinker and writer, Matthew Fox, writes that we are all called to be prophets, all called to be lovers and defenders of what we cherish. He imagines a world in which everyone says yes to what they are called to, whether Muslim or Jewish, Native American, Hopi, Potawatomi, or Buddhist, or Hindu, or Christian, or atheist. Imagine how these common affirmations to Collins, what an incredible bedrock of community it could create across the entire world. Yet as Margaret Mead says, it doesn't take huge communities, huge movements, a small number of people who say yes to a call can have an outsized impact as their calling then calls to us. Even the smallest yes to a call can have profound impacts. You know the word community, we've mentioned it a couple of times because we find our callings and the test of our callings in community. Have we truly been called? We don't know until others see it and are benefited by it. Community. So understanding what community is becomes as important as understanding what a calling is. I looked up the ancient roots of the word community, something that's important to the people here at All Souls. The word community literally means and meant to minister together. We, all of us here are, in our longing to be connected and in community, we are literally agreeing to be called to share ministry. To our own, to the ministries we do as a community. And the power of Unitarian Universalism is in its diversity because it's in that diversity that we have the best test of each other's callings. When an atheist has a calling or a theist has a calling, they are looking at each other's calls and reflecting on what they see and how they experience it. And the people as diverse as atheists and Christians and Hindus and Jews and pagans can vouch for the efficacy of each other's calls. Perhaps the truth we will be speaking of could actually be capitalized, capitalized T, truth. A truth stronger than any one religion could ever verify by itself. This was the call that Dr. King knew. And he lived his very life as a yes to this call. A call for us to live by the principles of peace, of mutual respect, of joy, for each other's beauty and connection to the holy and to life, cherishing one another in mutual appreciation. And when you listen to the second half of that, I have a dream. Well, not just a speech, but a sermon. You can hear it, you can feel it. He gave his life for this, for us, life calling itself into us and from us and for each other, again and again and again. 
calling us out of ourselves and into lives of service and meaning. May your calls be blessings. May they be blessings to your own lives, to each other's lives, to the lives of people all over Indianapolis, Indiana, the United States, even the world. May you have the strength and resources to be able to say yes, however that call comes to you, however you see it. I had to go off script a little bit for the closing words and figure out how to get the chalice in the, uh, in the shot. But you know, here's this chalice, we light it at the beginning of our services. We put it out at the end of the service. And actually John, Byrne prepare, John Burns prepares the candles for the next Sunday. But when the chalice flame itself goes out, the light in each of us need not go out. The light burns in each of us. Sometimes it gets lost, maybe seems to be only a very, barely dim ember. We have each other to rekindle it, to give it more air, more love. We may put the flame out, but no, the light is always alive in you, even if being held by others. And when you cannot find it, or cannot fully know how to hold it, know that we are here with love and care to help each other cherish and hold each other's flames. And to, the love the to love the lights that burn in all beings in this world. Go in peace, be in peace. We'll be together again.